it's working for really degenerative pathological states of being in people. We are getting ready to publish evidence of patients that have no evidence of Parkinson's. We have a great majority of our patients with Parkinson's report a 95% success rate of improvement of their quality of life. Now, I am specific on my language. I'm not saying we're curing 95% of people with Parkinson's. I'm saying their life quality has improved, their self-report. But we're also layering in a lot of other testing as well because we want to get more sophisticated with it to get better results, have more evidence, and really and build the case so that we can have more people believe it once they see it. Welcome to the Longevity Formula with Dr. Brandon Crawford. Let's explore the new era of wellness. Today, I am humbled and excited to introduce you to someone that I just got to engage in some really amazing conversations with. We just got to connect at the biohacking conference here recently. This is Dr. Greg Eckel. He is located in Park City, Utah, and this guy is doing some amazing work. I think you're going to be blown away as I was uh, and still am. He's still telling me things that I didn't know, so this is going to be amazing. So Dr. Eckel is a naturopathic physician. He's also a Chinese medicine practitioner. And what I love is his story and how it's unfolded to really guide him to where he is today. And so we're going to learn a lot today. We're going to be talking a lot about photons, electrons, and frequencies, and all the things, and how he's changing the world. Dr. Eckel, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. So. I'm excited. I really am because this is like right up my alley, right? And we have so many synergistic things that we can talk about. And when we connected in at the biohacking conference, I thought, man, this guy's doing great work. I got to, I got to learn more. I got to start referring to him. Like, this is amazing. So if you don't mind, I would love to kind of get into your story a little bit because I was rather intrigued because your story kind of begins back in the mid 19, uh, 1990s, I believe, where you started noticing that children were over medicated, right? Can you give me a little more information on that? Yeah, in the uh, mid 90s in Portland, Oregon, I was a Montessori preschool teacher as one of the things that I did in my young 20s. And it was the beginning of ADD, ADHD diagnosis. And I had a poster child, Michael, that I like to say he included others in his learning. He was a rambunctious dude. And in a Montessori classroom, you know, they get to pick their own work and they can go wherever they want. So he's always in other people's business. The main teacher, Mary Kay, advocated for him to be seen by the pediatrician. And lo and behold, he got the diagnosis of attention deficit disorder and hyperactivity disorder. And the first day, then he was medicated with Ritalin at that time. And the first day I remember it succinctly, it's etched in my memory banks, this little boy slumped in his chair, shoelaces untied, and that sparkle gone out of his eye. I thought, man, this is a four-year-old. There's got to be a better way to treat children with attentional issues. and you know, one thing led to another. I was, I thought eating healthy as a young 20 something as a vegetarian, I was eating, you know, frozen burritos, French fries and beer. I thought right. that was, you know, the way to eat. I, all roads led to the naturopathic school where I saw some student clinicians, they did a diet diary on me. And they called me a junk food vegetarian, which in retrospect, I was, they had me change my diet. And I felt better. And I thought, you know, if I went back to school, I definitely wanted to be in service to people and doing it with lifestyle medicine, herbs, acupuncture, et cetera, the more subtle energetic ways and more natural really meshed well with who I am on the planet. So it, all roads led to the naturopathic school. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, I echo that, right? So, I mean, my training is developmental functional neurology. So, I mean, childhood neurodevelopmental disorders is like, that's my background. That's like what we do. And and I totally agree, man. Like the, the way that we're 
treating our children right now in this country in traditional medical models, it's failing. And not only is it failing, but it's creating addictions. It's creating a neurochemistry that is not propagating a long-term health scenario and actually fueling further disease and degeneration, right? I mean, that's oh, ultimately what we're really, Yeah, when you look at what, I mean, you know, fast forward, that was 1996, or actually it was 1994 when that happened. And when I left Portland, Oregon two years ago, half the kids in the elite schools and the high schools were on, they're on some type of attention medicine. Stratera being a big one, Ritalin is still around, but it's not prescribed as much. But when you look at the research on these things, they do nothing for IQ. Right. You know, kids are trading them at parties. It's a party drug. It is a stimulant. It's like, when would you ever think it's appropriate to prescribe crack cocaine to kids, you know, and how those meds work? It's waking up the frontal lobe. That's kind of the tick, the nervousness, the the restlessness. All of that is the inherent intelligence trying to wake itself up and when there's no discussion of diet or looking at the parents, because most kids with attentional issues, their parents also have attentional issues. And you right. look at the, you know, social media and the engineering behind it, we're, we're getting engineered for short attention spans. And, you know, our neurochemistry follows that. So, you know, as the naturopath, I recommend get out into nature, get your feet on the planet, you know, let's, Let's actually get the sunlight on our bodies. You know, things like this that were never and still really aren't discussed in conventional land, right? Right. I, I think it's an old adage, but I think it applies where we need to think about a garden, right? If we're trying to grow food in a garden, right? And we have a plant that is struggling. We don't suddenly go, okay, what do I need to inject this plant with? What do, you know, what do I need? To, no, we go, okay, is it getting enough sunlight? Is it getting enough nutrients? Is, is it getting enough water? It's the same thing with us, right? I mean, yeah. come on, it just makes sense rather yeah. than genetically remodifying our dopaminergic loops and setting us up for anxiety and depression and all these things. It's sad, but there's people like you, there's people like us fighting and doing good work. So thank you so much for doing that. And I'm glad you're fighting the good fight with the yeah. rest of us. It's, well, it's And great likewise, good. kudos to you and, and the systems that you're setting up too. And you know, you mentioned it on the intro, you know, I, I think I know Dr. Kyle, maybe more peripherally just through online interactions. And so to come in contact and like, yeah, the, the serendipity was well-timed. And, you know, this, this aspect of we are light beings utilizing light to light up our mitochondria, feed energy into the system. It really is where we're going. I've been talking about it for a decade now. And to get effective change, there's some interesting technologies, your 528i lasers in particular. I'm excited to explore more with you for therapeutics for brain regeneration that we're living in exciting times. Absolutely. I mean, it's inarguable that our nervous system has an extremely intimate connection with light and it goes well beyond vitamin D. I mean, light is energy. It is, it is communicating to ourselves. So we need to acknowledge that and we need to harness it to the best of our abilities so that we can heal from otherwise incurable diseases, which we're going to talk about what you're doing, which is going to be awesome. I do have a question for you because in your, in the information you sent me, it says that your wife actually experienced Creutzfeldt Jacob disease. Yeah, so it's it's actually it's a bit of a sad story because Sarai actually passed. So okay. yeah, she that's really how I got into brain regeneration. I was about well, six years ago she passed, and 14 years ago we met each other. Wow. And I I did not know love could exist in this plane of existence, this physical mm -hmm. form. This woman found her way into a chamber of my heart that I did not know existed. So much so that we blended our families, her three kids, my two kids. We even had a maid named Alice, just like the Brady Bunch. And we oh, wow. blended our 
medical practices. She was certified nurse midwife, nurse practitioner in her, you know, early forties. We bought our first house together as a family. And, you know, when you move, things get displaced and it's stressful, right? Moving is stressful, especially when you're blending families, kids, all of that jazz. Well, we had Fiesta Ware plate and there was one plate, this orange Fiesta Ware plate went missing as things do when you move. But it wasn't, it was like a harbinger for ominous things to come. It's like an eerie groundhog day, like multiple times a day, Sarai would go looking for this orange Fiesta Ware plate. And it wasn't just once, it was multiple times a day. It became fodder for the kids and I around the dinner table. You know, she'd be in the cupboards then down the hallway into the garage and then into the attic, like looking for this plate. But she wouldn't remember that she just went looking for the plate. And, you know, one day in this trajectory, my office manager came to me, Chelsea, and she said, hey, doc, Sarai just left the building. I'm like, what do you mean she left the building? Yeah, she just strolled out with her lab jacket, stethoscope on, said goodbye to her patients. And, you know, this was a, she was a special being. I mean, you know, women listening, if you've ever been to the gynecologist, it's not like your favorite visit of the year to go see the gynecologist. The women would come out of this room with Soraya, they'd be singing and doing a little jig and laughing. It's like, what in the world are they doing in there? She was that type of practitioner, that type of being. And to have her just memory going quickly, so quickly, you know, it was at that moment when she walked out of the building, I knew we needed to do something. So we cleared the schedule and went outside of my practice. I I'd looked at, was it mold? Was it, you know, hormone imbalances? Like the more typical things for a young 40 year old with some memory issues, possibly stress related. It wasn't any of those things. And I went looking and it quickly put me on a trajectory on Oh, Case Western has the Prionic Surveillance Center in North America. Well, I hmm. didn't know that, but yeah, in Ohio, it's a prionic activity. Well, what are prions? These are misfolded proteins. There, there's no known cure as of yet. So this differential became autoimmune encephalitis and Chrisville Jacob disease, which is mad cow syndrome in people. It's spongiform mm -hmm. encephalitis. You get holes in your brain from proteins misfolding and conglomerating and destroying the, the nervous system. And it is a horrendous condition. I don't wish it on anybody. It's very rare. I always knew Soraya was one in a million. Unfortunately, the medical community agreed with me. And it was on the differential. On the end of that ride, they give you a free brain biopsy to ensure it was Gritzfeld Jacob disease. Wow. Um, within two months of her first symptoms, she lost the ability to speak and feed herself. That's how rapid the dementia was in this Man. condition. Having a full practice, the kids and the care for Soraya, I was, I was really not, uh, was not looking good across the board. I had to pull in hospice, not that I was giving up care. I was swinging for the fence looking for solutions on how do you regenerate the brain. Right. Unfortunately, what I found didn't help her one iota. You know, we surrounded her with love. She did pass 18 months from her first symptom to when she left her body. In a weird way, Doc, it ripped me open as a human. It reinstated my faith in such a curious way in unity consciousness of we must have written this before we got here. It's like, this is freaking tragic. Like I didn't even know right. you could relate to another being on the planet like this. And now, you know, she has left her body. So navigating grief and loss and all of that component with the kids and myself and the practice, it, it really lit a fire under me. It's given me a deep, deep appreciation for the preciousness of life and I figured, you know what? We don't know how long we're here. I got it. I'm playing it small. Let's go for it. So, you know, there hasn't been major breakthroughs in neurodegeneration in 300 years. What I uncovered along the way is helping thousands of patients a year now. And we're getting ready to publish some really exciting research on some other prionic activity neurodegenerative states like Parkinson's disease. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very sad, and and I hate that that happened to you, right? I mean, no one 
ever wants to experience that type of loss, that type of yeah. trauma. But unfortunately, this is the life that we have. And sometimes these events are what really fuel us to break through, right? And that's what yeah. it seems like has happened, right? So it gave you a deeper understanding, not just of science, but of life. Right. And, and I think that's really what you're getting at, right? Is you're getting at, hey, look, there's, there's science and we acknowledge that and we love it. And, but we have to understand that sometimes we can't objectively measure, measure everything in traditional medicine. Sometimes we need to go a little bit beyond maybe yep. a little bit into, into quantum mechanics, right? So big time. Did, yeah. yeah. So, so now you're looking into this and you're doing it. So give us an idea about like, what are you doing? How are you really yeah. saving the world now? So we, you know, I use the moniker cutting edge therapeutics through an ancient lens. So as a Chinese medicine practitioner, the emperors of China were obsessed with longevity, right? We think now modern day, we discover longevity. It's like, no, this has been in a forever <laughs> long pursuit for longevity. Right. And before finding regenerative medicine and being Chinese medicine naturopathic provider, it was always about, you know, we had the... We had the emperor's medicine, you know, they, they got the best herbalist and the best acupuncturist and they were looking for their vigor and vitality into their 80s, which was a long lifespan back then when the average lifespan was 50. And, you know, then fast forward to today where we've got regenerative medicine, which is one of the biggest levers that I've come across and, you know, is looking at medicinal signaling cells or MSCs that are mesenchymal or mesenchymal stem cells from placenta and whole tissue to I'm on the medical advisory board for V cell procedures, very small embryonic like stem cells. They're laser activated and guided to hyperbaric oxygen, to sound therapy and sound bowls and frequencies Skinar technology, pulsed electromagnetic frequency, low level laser therapy, acupuncture, bioelectric acupuncture, intentions, and creating fields around people. So we're utilizing all of the facets from biochemistry, physiology, but also into the frequency medicine because that ultimately, you know, we're light beings being compressed down into these meat suits. This is the slowest form of matter or of frequency is into this mattered body. And you can have frequency and matter and coexist at the same time. I know that's a little controversial, but it, there is this polarity that we have to come to peace with because we can't explain it. Otherwise, it's just whatever lens you put on is what you're going to see. Yes. So we utilize and we're bringing frequency medicine. You know, we all understand frequency and I know your listeners are way educated on frequency, but you know, we have these supercomputers in our pocket. Well, there's waves, frequencies coming in with information that this thing receives and interprets as information. Well, these things that we walk around calling our bodies, the miracles of life, like we it's, you know, unfathomable the what are the odds of life and yet alone conscious life, you know, it will it's mind boggling and we take it for granted every day. And so really honoring and educating around the majesty, the mystery and the frequency of life is one a lot more fun, as I know you can attest to. But it's also much more effective in that it's getting better, faster, quicker results, more profound results that actually stay. They don't wear off. Oftentimes our patients say, well, will this wear off? It's like, no, actually your innate intelligence has healed itself. It doesn't wear off, you know. So we stack all of those therapeutics together in a, you know, in what I call the ECHL protocol, we've trademarked that for brain regeneration. So we've got the ECHL diet, the ECHL protocol. And why have I dubbed it that is because it's not a static protocol. It's a way of thinking. It's a deep presence with people. And it's really incorporating new findings because we're consciousness moving on, you know, accelerated speed turning around corners that we can't see, you know? And so when you get into that 
stepping out into the unknown with our patients, having those conversations on a deep heart level, and innovating for maybe on a fractal component of, you know, we're going to go in what makes the most sense to the individual in front of us. There's a framework that we put on them or around it so that we've got some bumpers and predictability of result. And we're open to, to say, you know what, what we did five years ago is obsolete. We're, we have new data, we have new information, and it is, it's exponentially changing right now. You know, when you put in large language databases and supercomputing on top of data sets with real life experience, we are living at really profound times that I'm excited to be able to get this information out to as many people that want to listen, you know, because there is free will and choice. So we have that aspect to, to handle as well. <laughs> Absolutely, man. You know, that's, that's all beautifully stated and it's, it's a great to have this conversation with someone that, that does have a deep conversation about it. And, and I love that your protocol is fluid, if you will. Right. Because yeah, that's how it should be. And that, that's the same for us, right? These, these protocols are not static. They need to be, evolving with what we know and what we learn both about the patient, but then also about the advancing technologies. Yeah. And one thing I, I think I want the listeners to understand is the concepts that Dr. Eckel just went through. This goes all the way back to Einstein, right? This goes back to the double slit experiment. This goes back to the discovery of particle wave duality, right? Mm -hmm. and, and what they found there was that when they would shine a photon through two slits, right? They would find that these particles that we now call photons acted as both particles and waves. And then they shot electrons as well to see if electrons would do the same. And the interesting thing is that your observation or the person's observation of that experiment would dictate the result, right? And so that's where this concept of intention mm. comes from. And for the people out there that are going, man, this is a bunch of woo woo, whatever. I need people to understand that John Bell, if we fast forward, you know, so there was, there was Einstein and then Nels Bohr, you know, got into it. And then John Bell actually confirmed that Bohr was actually right, not Einstein. But quantum entanglement is real. And not only is it real, but banking systems use quantum entanglement technology to transmit to each other because it's safe and it's definable and it's predictable. So these concepts are not just us going, oh yeah, let's, you know, sit around and talk about the, you know, all the stuff that sounds cool or what it, no, this is real science. It's tangible, it's objectifiable. So I yeah. love that you're having this conversation. This is, this is amazing. Those, the, and those concepts, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that they haven't, more people aren't talking about it with the body. And, you know, we can speculate as to why, but we're utilizing these in advanced systems of banking. And yet we get this resistance when we say, well, that can happen with your body too, <laughs> which it just is, you know, again, we have these supercomputers sitting in our pockets and so we understand, we just kind of take it for granted, honestly. Yeah. And, but you, when you realize how that works, this is a thousand times more complicated and complex and dynamic than that, you know, than the computer world, the ones and zeros and nulls of programming, you know, you get into a living laboratory of life with multiple systems coming at it. It, it has made my job with that understanding much harder to realize, you know, it could be traumas of this lifetime or ancestral traumas affecting my patient in front of me. And, yes. you know, again, research around epigenetic changes. It could be your great, 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 great grandmother had some stress in the potato famine in Ireland or was a... Jew in concentration camps or, you know, some tragic event in your family lineage that changed the epigenetic expression for you today. And you might be experiencing anxiety and you have no idea where it's coming from. Well, it has made our job as clinicians. We've got to take that history 
and that understanding of the epigenetics and ancestral lineages, which is really an energetic component of the way that I talk about that was the creators were not messing around with infinity. It is forever right. forward and back. And, you know, to have that concept of, okay, we can get into this discussion. It can go in a lot of different directions, Dr. Crawford, but the, the, the way of the N of one and having this on the longevity formula, I really wanted to share this information with your listeners and viewers because it's working for really degenerative pathological states of being in people. We are getting ready to publish evidence of patients that have no evidence of Parkinson's. We have a great majority of our patients with Parkinson's report a 95% success rate of improvement of their quality of life. Now I am specific on my language. I'm not saying we're curing 95% of people with Parkinson's. I'm saying their life quality has improved their self report, but we're also layering in a lot of other testing as well, because we want to get more sophisticated with it to get better results, have more evidence and really, and build the case so that we can have more people believe it once they see it. Right. So there is that, uh, I got to see it to believe it. Some say you have to believe it to see it, but I, you know, there is those early renegades that we can get in on the results. They can reflect back to community. Community says, hey, they're just like me. That could happen for me. So we start to utilize and snowball those results for people. And, you know, it is kind of like that Buckminster Fuller moment of you create the new system, the old one becomes irrelevant. I have no interest in proving this to a medical establishment that has been captured and by big pharma and has an interest of disease and sick management care. Right. So I am in it for people from my own loss. I don't want my loss to be for naught. So I'm sharing what we've discovered and trying to get the word out as much as possible. Absolutely. Yeah, man. I mean, unfortunately, it is interesting to look through this through the lens that you just brought to light. You know, you have our system that they're utilizing these technologies for money, right? For banking systems, because it's safer, it's more effective, et cetera. But why then do we just only pour billions and trillions of dollars into pharmaceuticals, which have their place? Fine, right. that, whatever. But I mean, you're sitting here saying that, look, I've got a 95 success rate with Parkinson's and neurodegenerative diseases. I mean, my gosh, we should be pouring that money to further examine this to further study it and confirm it. I mean, what what kind of things? So can you speak to that 95% success rate for me? Like, what do these people look like? And how do they when they come to you? What do they look like? And then yeah. how are they looking now? So we we're basically a destination center as I, I think that yours are as well, mm -hmm. because this care isn't really it's not available in a lot of places a lot. There's a an equivalent maybe in China, they're not doing the intentions or the field work that we're doing, they're not utilizing the sound. We, we start remotely on a, you know, webinar and or a call. And you know, I'm, I'm going to put forth a little detect correct, protect quiz uh, for your listeners and viewers. You asked for that and I've got it now as a starting spot in the framework of how we think through, well, how do you progress here? Everybody, this could be newly diagnosed. This could be loved ones worried about getting the diagnosis. Maybe you've seen your parents or your grandparents go through some neurodegeneration, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia, or it could be somebody that has had the diagnosis for a long time and the medications aren't wearing off. Now in Parkinson's, there's no corrective care. It's all symptomatic treatment. And you might be wondering like why Parkinson's? You said your wife passed of Christopher Jacob disease. Well, in the it's still in the first edition, the prionic textbook. Stanley Prusiner got a Nobel Prize 1987 UCSF for the discovery of prions, which are misfolded proteins. These are like senescent cells, like cancer cells or zombie cells, but in the protein realm that start signaling other proteins to misfold. Well, what's in that book? You've got Parkinson's disease, that's alpha-synuclein. You have beta amyloid plaque in, in Alzheimer's and dementia realm. You Lewy bodies for Lewy body dementias. So you have a lot of different misfolded proteins in the prionic textbook. I chose Parkinson's because there's a lot more people that have Parkinson's. 
but it is this framework can work for all of these new neurodegenerative states. And it starts with foundational work, honestly, and I'm sure you see this. Everybody wants to know, what can I take, doc? What can mm -hmm. I do? Will that right. laser just work for me? And the answer is yes, maybe, but ultimately you want to start with a strong foundation. So it's doing a proper workup outside of the central nervous system. The, you know, everybody's focused with Parkinson's on substantia nigra, dopaminergic, dopamine receptors, and the destruction. Well, that's the tip of the iceberg. That's the last end stage of this disease. And we want to go to the iceberg, like what is under the surface? Well, that starts in the gut. It looks at levels of toxicity. It looks at chronic infections, Lyme and mold, herpes simplex virus, Epstein-Barr, cytolomegalo. These can all mimic Parkinsonism in other neurodegenerative states. We look at your hormones. 100% of patients that I talk to with Parkinson's diagnosis, and actually across the board, any chronic disease, you ask them what happens when you get stressed, their symptoms get worse. Well, why? Well, that's cortisol. It's from your adrenal gland that then relates to testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, which relates to thyroid. There's an endocrine triangle that needs to get addressed. That's a low-hanging fruit for everybody with neurodegeneration. When you go to see the neurologist, they're not talking hormones with you. No. You know, and there are benefits with the thyroid and its activity on the brain, progesterone with its protective mechanism on the brain, in particular for women. So, you know, these are all there is clinical evidence, but then also research evidence to support each facet of the workup. From the workup, then we go, you know, if you have uncontrolled sugars, you're not a candidate. If, you know, hemoglobin A1C above six, 7%, we want to get you under six and a half, but under seven will we'll take you. But if it's above 7%, that's your three month window of sugars. If it's, you, it's not going to be as beneficial. If you have heavy metal toxicity, I see mercury, cadmium, mer uh, arsenic, and lead are the mm -hmm. top four, but we test for 15 different metals. If you have a metal burden, where do you store toxins? You store it in our fat, right? right. We can affectionately call each other fatheads right, with love. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yes. <laughs> and so, but you want to make sure you don't have metals in there because that that is a big hole in the bottom of the bucket. The things that we put in on the top, supplement-wise, regenerative medicine-wise, laser, oxygen, et cetera, we're just not going to get the traction that we're looking for. Right. So uh, I'll pause there. Let's see what comes up. Yeah, man. I mean, it, it's kind of circling back to what we were talking about. I mean, we need to treat this like a garden. You know, what could be killing the plants? What do we need to give them so that they can thrive? You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's ultimately, you know, what we're talking about. And, and you're just talking about, look, we are these energetic beings that are in this current receptive field we call earth however you want to speak about that and and we have certain needs we have nutrients we have needs that go beyond those tangible elements one of them being love right and that's where yeah. my next discussion was going to go because you do talk about infusing love into medicine and then obviously this is a big thing for me too you know i mean shoot i just named a company 528 innovations because 528 hertz is the frequency of love i mean this is huge for me I have yeah. 528 on everything. I have it on my wallet. I have it on like all of my passwords, like everything. I think it's exceedingly important. So how do you infuse love in your medicine and what you do? Yeah. So that, you know, it's interesting. And I'm going to default back to Chinese medicine. There's no word for mind body medicine in Chinese medicine. It is whole heart centered medicine. The heart, you know, symbolically is the emperor empress. And I love that. I love that the, the system, one of the main frameworks that I operate out of, acknowledged 5,000 years ago, the heart is the matter of the thing, right? So we, one, we train our staff that they are the field. In our morning huddles, we do activities, qigong or energy work and or intentions of viewing all patients, including ourselves, as we cross the threshold is healed. Our intention is to increase the vibration and frequency around every living soul that enters our space. 
We project that through the green dot as well. And then, you know, I was actually just at meeting with my office manager operations this morning saying, you know, we have some new team members on board and I want to make sure they understand that the culture that we're bringing here is we are heart centered beings and we're bringing love into the equation of healthcare where it really deserves to be without, you know, we know love wins in the end, but you know, my explicit message now is, you know, my goal is to help people get into heart and brain coherence, drop into their hearts and create from there so that we can actualize heaven on earth bef- sooner than we ever dream possible. And because that's the, that's the world that I, we live in. And we, we have that lens, we have that opportunity. I have the gumption, you know, basically, I, I feel I've been unleashed just from my own loss that Hey, time is of the essence. This message needs to get out. Right. Uh, it's time. That's what I came for. You know, that's what we're doing. Yeah. And it is, it's so important that presence, you know, family member, you know, his wife just got diagnosed with cancer and they've got small children. And he was asking me like, look, Greg, you went through this. What, what do you recommend? And you know, I said, look, the, you can take this as a tragedy, and it is on one level. On the other le- level, don't miss the blessings in this. And he just looked at me like, what are you talking about? It's like, look, this brings you into the ever eternal present now of what actually matters. Like, you got to meticulously care for the energetics in your space with your family. People are going to project their their experiences of cancer on you and your family and their loss. And, you know, it's going to touch them in their areas of trauma or hurt or dysfunction. And you can't allow that reflection because it's not a reflection. It's their own stuff coming at you. Mm -hmm. And if we all understood that, like, what are we projecting? What are we emitting from our being? You know, some of this comes from Joe Dispenza's work, Lynn McTaggart with her power of eight and intentions and, group settings and healings and coherent healing. You know, I was just doing a training with heart math on heart rate variability and coherence. And, you know, all of those facets of bringing that awareness on how you change your brain and how do you get into that field, that reset button, our, you know, our original state, all dis-ease is a separation from source. And so it's how do we get back to that source component and remove the obstacles to cure? That's kind of our job as the providers and physicians. And then really, I I even I have a red pom pom next to my desk that I cheer (laughs) for my patients as well, you know, because it does. Sometimes you need a cheerleader to keep you in the game, right? That's funny. Okay, I'm going to have to go get me some pom poms. That's good. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, That's hilarious. That's good, man. I mean. You know, it kind of makes me think because, you know, we do, we do mind body in our office too. We have Dr. Jerry that, that leads that and, and I'm involved in that as well. And it's interesting because we will have pediatric anesthesiologists on site to help us because we have some really intense, really complex pediatric brain injuries or other types of things that we, we just need that level of care to do some of these procedures. And these anesthesiologists, I remember one specifically, she was sitting in the office. It was when we first started doing this. And I just go over to her and I'm like, what do you think about all this? And she looks at me and she goes, I think this is a load of bullshit. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm like, okay, she's honest. Thank you. And we just, I'm like, that's fine. And we just talk about it. I'm not trying to convince her or whatever. And fast forward, you know, a few months later, and she sat in on, you know, dozens of these procedures and I go back to her and I go, well, you're still here. So what do you think now? And she said, you know, I don't know what it is, but people are getting better. Mm. And, and I just see them transforming. She said, I, I wish there were studies. I wish there was something to, you know, help me understand this better, but there's not. But I cannot disregard the fact that I see patients getting better. And I thought, you know what? that's good enough for me. I love that. And and that's what I want from all practitioners, right? I just need everyone to go, look, you're not hurting anyone. You're only helping people. 
So let's let's try and engage. Let's try and co-manage. Let's try and work together, right? That's really what I yeah. want to bring to the scene because these are really good medical providers, man. I mean, I get to talk with surgeons and, like I said, anesthesiologists, and, yes. and we've done a good job co-managing and building teams. And sometimes you just get people that are just, they're just turned off. They're just like, no, that's not medicine. We're not going to do that, et cetera. And it's sad because we all need each other. We all need to, you know, collaborate. And that's really what we need. You know, some people will, some people don't, but whatever. It's, yeah, so true. And, you know, the component on it really is in the results. Are you, are, are results happening or not? I, yeah, I too, I want the evidence. I want the research, but our patients don't have 20 to 30 years to wait right. for exactly. that criterion. And when you look at the NIH and what's happening there, those agencies are captured. They're not funding this research. Mm -hmm. um, people are having to make choices, hard choices out of their own pockets to get the care that they know they deserve. And, you know, it would be different. I think there is, there's obviously there's a continuum here of care and it's not for everybody. However, what I ask my patients is, is there, do you have an answer? Do you have a definitive answer in the West, in the Western approach? And, you know, they don't, there is no definitive answer there. Like we're further along with our research than the best, most funded research facilities in this country. I think, well, that's ridiculous. I'm a solo practitioner. I have a staff, but like that's coming out of Dr. Greg Eccles' mind, his bandwidth, that my patients, I'm honored that people come here, right? We're humbled by it. And to witness the change, you know, I'll share a story of, and, and kind of this speaks into where we're at with the system. I had a woman, Holly, come up from Austin, Texas. She started remotely. We sent, we did the workups. We got the records. You know, she had a significant tremor with Parkinson's, inability stutter step, and really slowing down on her gait and was becoming disabled. We found some things in her gut, things with her hormones, a little bit of detoxification that had to happen. We had her come out for our brain regeneration camp. Within the first three months, she went back to her neurologist and the neurologist apologized to her. Now, she was diagnosed for a decade and had all of the telltale signs, was responding to carbidopa, levodopa. So all of the signals saying, yes, you indeed had Parkinson's. Her provider didn't pick up the phone to say, maybe I should ask Dr. Greg what he's doing up there because my patient has no evidence of this disease anymore. In her reality and on her lens, she could only see, oh, I must have misdiagnosed this patient. That's the only reality this doctor or physician had. And right. so what I tell people, like, look, if you're satisfied with your providers looking at you and they're, they don't have any intention of leaving the door open for a spontaneous, I'll even say spontaneous remission. Sure. But I think we're getting better than that. You know, 25 years into it, I like to say we see a lot of spontaneous remissions in our center, as I'm sure you do as well. And, but it, no, they don't pick up the phone. They don't call. They're not curious. They don't mm -hmm. have time to. They're, they're bustling, seeing the next patient. And at, at the same time, so that's how fractionated the system is. And so when I, you know, get asked that, like, well, what will my neurologist say? I said, well, they're going to say nothing because there's no salesperson coming around to sell this to them. Right. You know, that's a piece of the why I trademarked the echo protocol is we want to start training other providers on, look, this is what we're doing. And as we collect larger and larger data sets, we're looking to make more and more connections. You know, we're using advanced testing with digital twinning and mitochondria testing and getting in metabolomics and getting into, you know, laboratory science needs to be disrupted as much as medicine. Sure. And we're, we're just at the forefront of that, but to have patients step out into the unknown and go for it is inspiring. And yes. then to get results like that, I had another patient, Ellen from uh, Nevada, similar case with Parkinson's, you know, startled at any any little buzz or bell was really slowing down. Her world was becoming smaller. She was retracting because kind of embarrassed of being in public with the tremor, et cetera. 
And, you know, we she got double verified afterwards. So her physician neurologist sent her to Mayo and Cleveland to get the workup to make sure she didn't have Parkinson's anymore. So I on hers, and that's another case that we're publishing, we have before and after imaging, which I'm really excited about because that to the Western mind, we need to have some of that right. evidence to support even the subjective components of the patient saying, and all telltale signs gone. You know, she was up on her cupboards cleaning, dusting. I was like, well, wait, we may not want to go that far, Ellen. Like, let's <laughs> calm it down. Right. I don't want you getting injured on the cupboards. But, right. you know, to have her life back for her retirement, et cetera, is really, it's just inspiring. Absolutely. And, and it's a message of hope that people need to hear because, unfortunately, what we hear time and time again is that, you know, they someone gets this crushing diagnosis and then, they're just told this is how it is. You know, this is, you know, what you can expect. Or in a lot of the cases we hear, you know, they say, just pull the plug. They're not going to make it through. Fortunately, you're right. I mean, I do. You're right in that it used to be that people would go and doctors would say, oh, we must have misdiagnosed or you're just a you know random case that, OK, that may have worked for. I have been getting calls from various hospitals like one was here local. It was the it was the. I forget his title, but he was in charge of like pediatric neuro rehab or something like mm. that. And he just had a, a, a cool email. You know, he just said, hey, you know, I've got a patient that we're co-managing and I'm seeing great, great outcomes with what you're doing. I, I just want you to know that we support it and keep doing it. I'm awesome. like, whoa, you know, I've wow. never gotten that yeah, before. Ties um, are turning. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, it's not happening a lot, but I have gotten a few of those. So that's great. I do. I do think that there is hope. There's hope for humanity. There's hope for medicine. I believe that people want answers, right? And that's why people are stepping out on faith because they want yeah. answers. I mean, they're not getting it in the hospitals. They're not getting right. it anywhere else. So, so tell us about your book, right? So this is called Shake It Off and where can people find it and who should read it? Yeah, that one is on Amazon and it's not just for folks with Parkinson's or concerned for Parkinson's. So Shake It Off, an integrative approach to Parkinson's solutions. Well, in there, I also lay out my fancy protocol. So the ECHO protocol is in there on the <laughs> stages of neuro regeneration on how do you have your brain heal and do it with a regenerative focus. So it's not an extensive be all end all, but it is the framework of what we use day to day with our patients to get results. I'm actually in revision. We're creating a new a new book is coming out, I think, in the fall. It's called The Parkinson's Miracles with updated protocols because that was five years ago. It's still worth it. You can get it on Amazon, Shake It Off, Dr. Eckel, because if you just type in Shake It Off, you're going to get a lot of Taylor Swift. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Well, how else can people find you? How do you how do you want to tell people where to find you and, and you know, how to engage? Yeah, so Energy for Life Centers, and if you go to go.energy4lifecenters.com backslash quiz, that's where you, you will have, you'll be taken through a bunch of questions on our detect, correct, and protect methodology and the bioenergetic uh, flagship of Energy for Life Centers here in Park City, Utah. That's awesome. Well, my friend, is there anything else that you would like to educate or inspirate or whatever you would like to do to everyone uh, listening today? I think, you know, for the Longevity Formula podcast and Dr. Crawford, I, I want to just say thank you, you know, for spending this time together. Remember the be in awe of the miracle of life. We are in it together. We don't know how long we're on the planet. So make it make it for real. Like this is not a dress rehearsal. This is the show. So we are creators. We haven't been taught how powerful we truly are. Get quiet, internal. The answer lies within and get into that heart. Start asking questions in there and you may be surprised at what the answer is. Absolutely. Well, man, I really do appreciate your time today. This was a really deep conversation. I'm glad that we were able to engage in it because like I said earlier, not everyone is really able to understand and most people aren't even willing to go down these roads, right? Mm. So my hope is that this conversation will spark 
some new ideologies, some new concepts, and really just ignite hope in people that are out there trying to uncover some things for themselves or for their loved ones, you know? Sure. That's the goal, right? That's the goal of the podcast, man. So if you're listening, guys, in this message that you, know, you think can help someone, please share it with them. That's why we're taking time out of our day, right? That's why we're not with patients right now. That's why we're not doing the things that we you know, otherwise would be doing right now. We are doing this to help others. So please share. And again, Dr. Echo, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. We hope today's episode has inspired you to take that next step toward your best self. Remember, the path to longevity is paved with small daily decisions. Your journey is unique, and every step, every choice, brings you closer to your ultimate vision of a healthier, happier life. For more insights, tips, and resources, visit drbrandoncrawford.com.